Well, good afternoon and welcome to Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, the Walter P. Stern Distinguished Fellow here at Hudson Institute. I'd like to welcome everybody for both here in the audience and also online for our very special event today, More, Better, Faster, a conversation with Senators Risch and Wicker on U.S. support for Ukraine. Now, Senator uh, Jim Risch and Senator Roger Wicker are, of course, very prominent voices uh, in the foreign policy debate in the U.S. Senate. They are the ranking members, leading Republican members on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and Senate Armed Services uh, Committee, uh, respectively. Uh, they have a, both have had long and distinguished uh, careers in public service. They represent the heart of our country, Senator Risch from uh, Idaho, Senator Wicker from uh, Mississippi, and most importantly, I, that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as we're concerned today, uh, they have been vocal on the need uh, first for the Biden administration to do more in the lead up to uh, the Ukraine war in terms of deterring Russia, and then for the United States to do more uh, in supporting Ukraine uh, in its uh, war against Russia, and have done so in a uh, principled, realistic manner, uh, really uh, making the case that supporting Ukraine is in America's national interest. And doing so, uh, mastering the details of the b debate, and uh, doing so in a way that has garnered uh, even more respect for these uh, two gentlemen on Capitol Hill. We'll begin with opening remarks, first from Senator Risch, then from Senator Wicker, and then the two of them will engage in conversation with uh, my Hudson Institute colleague, Rebecca Heinrich. She is a senior fellow here at Hudson Institute, directs our Keystone Defense Initiative, and she is also a leading voice on foreign and defense policy issues and has become, a, as well, a leading voice on the uh, debate uh, over Ukraine uh, here in Washington and beyond. So uh, it's an honor to welcome uh, Senator Risch to the podium, and we'll hear shortly thereafter from uh, Senator Wicker. Thank you, Senator Risch. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, uh, thanks for having me here today. The toughest part of giving a speech like this is, uh, you know, I've been dealing with this thing uh, day in and day out for the last year, and and actually to the run-up to it for uh, for some time. And so as a result of that, it's difficult to stand up here in just a few minutes, but I'm, I'm going to do my best to condense this down to a few general remarks, then we'll get some questions and, uh, and other areas that you might have of interest, you can drill down with, uh, with questions, and we'll see if we can't uh, get them answered. You know, it's hard to believe that it's been a year since, uh, since this whole thing started. And uh, there, there were arguments as to whether or not this was actually going to happen. I was one of the few people that thought that he might not do this, because twice before he'd uh, accumulated on the border and then not gone in. And, you know, when you get to thinking about it, uh, when it comes to Putin, he – uh, he had the world by the tail. I mean, this guy could be a dictator for the rest of his life, uh, had a, uh, a life that uh, most human beings uh, couldn't even dream of living, and really nothing endangered his uh, uh, status as uh, head of Russia, with one exception. Uh, he, could, he could choose uh, one thing that could bring that down. Now, I know heads of state of a lot of different countries with the President of the United States being the freest country in the world, through a lot of despots around the world, and all of them have one thing in common, one thing that they desperately want, and that is to stay in power. And so certainly that was crossing his mind as he made a determination as to whether or not to do this. And certainly uh, he, he could have envisioned a situation where the thing would go south on him and he would, he would lose the standing that he had. Uh, he didn't. He didn't make that uh, judgment. He made he, he made a tremendous number of mistakes, and and misjudged a lot of things. Um, first and foremost of which was the ability of his own uh, troops. Uh, the uh, what's happened is, of course, this myth we had of this superpower uh, has just evaporated. I mean, they uh, uh, they performed incredibly poorly uh, on the on the battlefield, and the thing that um, the, the thing that it makes you wonder, it, wh when it was so bad, um, how far does that go up? We know what his ground game is like. It's awful. Uh, it's 140 million people against uh, 44 million people, and and they got beat. And they got they've gotten beat badly on the ground. Even when the other saw, even with the possession of uh, of modern uh, 21st century weapons, 
But in any event, he made that mistake. The other mistake he made is he, he certainly thought, uh, watching the debate, particularly over recent years, that this would divide NATO. Uh, he, he couldn't have been more wrong on that. NATO is stronger today than it's been in decades. Um, we're going to get two new members of NATO, of NATO and uh, it, it, we're having a little dust up with Turkey and, uh, and with Hungary, but we'll, we'll get through that. But we're going to come out of this 32 strong um, and, uh, uh, and much stronger than what we were before. The Europeans are committed to, I think, as we are committed to, that when, this, uh, when the shooting ends, we're going to have to beef up the uh, eastern flank. Having those two extra countries is going to be helpful because obviously there's two new pocketbooks at the table uh, to help do that. Plus, we have a we'll, we'll have a lot more uh, uh, frontage with uh, with Russia, and uh, you can argue that it'd be harder to defend. I would argue that it's better to have that much uh, because it's uh, it'll be tougher on Russia. So anyway, uh, Putin made those mistakes, and uh, and now he's got the tiger by the tail and can't let go. Um, He's lost this war. Ukraine has not won this war, but Russia has lost it. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to quit shooting. That doesn't mean they're going to stop destroying cities. But think about what he set out to do. What he set out to do was to bring down the administration in that country and then occupy the country and turn it into a Belarus uh, sort of situation. That's over. That's done. He will never, ever occupy Ukraine. I deal with the Ukrainian people, everybody from Zelensky on down, and I'm telling you, they will fight with broomsticks in the streets uh, to see that uh, they are not occupied. So I, I'm convinced that, uh, that Russia has, uh, has lost, uh, and um, how it ends, of course, is a, is a different situation, but um, the Ukrainians are doing their best to win, and uh, we're going to do everything we can to help them. So how did we get here? Um, we're getting pushback from, you, you see some of the commentators, particularly the far right commentators, and for that matter, the far left commentators are saying, what are we doing with Ukraine? You know, what, what, what the heck do we do here? Well, I would argue that we have uh, not only a uh, moral responsibility to do this, but we have a, a legal responsibility to do this. This starts with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan spent eight years trying to bring down the Soviet Union, and he did that, and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. The various countries that were in the orbit uh, got, got their freedom. They were set free. A lot of them took democracy and looked west. Some of them didn't. Um, but what happened when the Soviet Union broke up into the various countries, four countries came out of there with nuclear weapons. Obviously, Russia did, Belarus did, um, uh, uh, Kazakhstan did, and of course, Ukraine did. It was the policy of the United States of America then. It's the policy of the United States of America now that as few countries as possible have nuclear weapons. So what do we do? We sat down with the Ukrainians on December 4th, uh, December 5th, 1994 in Budapest and talked them into giving up their nuclear weapons. We, we made an offer and we said, if you will give up your nuclear weapons, we will, uh, we will give you security. And, uh, and they said, fine, they give up the, the nuclear weapons. Now a lot of people say, oh, they poo-poo that and say, well, they, they did that because they couldn't afford them anyway, blah, blah, blah. Do you think they would make that decision today if they were, uh, if they were given the opportunity to give up the, the nuclear weapons? Of course they wouldn't. So we, we made a commitment at that time. That makes it, in my judgment, a legal commitment, but it's also a, a moral commitment and certainly uh, finishing up the work of Ronald Reagan uh, to keep the uh, Soviet Union from rebuilding again, which is what Putin wants to do. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the execution of the, uh, uh, of the prosecution of the war. Uh, I've been a not real vocal, but vocal uh, proponent of uh, giving them uh, as much as we possibly can. My view is if it shoots, they ought to have it, uh, other than nuclear weapons. And that starts with, uh, with the uh, I'm, I'm perfectly fine and have urged the administration to give them uh, F-16s for a lot of different reasons, not the least of which, recall that the Russians flew their MiGs against us. They gave MiGs to the, to the North Vietnamese and to the North Koreans and trained their pilots and, ran them, and flew them against us. Here's an opportunity to return the favor. Not only that, I'd like to see how the F-16s compare to the SUs when, uh, when they get in the sky together. So it's an opportunity there. Look, I am so sick and tired of hearing people say, oh, we can't do this, it'll be escalation. I want Putin to start waking up in the morning worrying about what he's going to do that might cause the West to escalate. Uh, so uh, 
in, in any event, I'm, I'm not a great fan of this argument that, well, we can't escalate. If you don't escalate, you're going to lose. You've got to do more and better than your opponent does to win the war. So you need to talk about what you're going to do to escalate. So I'm all in for, for escalation. Well, uh, let me get to the end here as rapidly as I can. Um, look, when this is over, it's not over. There's going to be fallout from this for a long, long time to come. You know, like I said, I deal with the Ukrainians all the time. These people are hurt. They are angry. Uh, be before Putin invaded the uh, Crimea, the polling in, in Ukraine was about 85% of Ukrainians felt either neutral or actually pretty good about Russia. Today, that's, that is flipped and flipped uh, way beyond that. Um, they're angry at Russia. There is not going to be a reconciliation commission when this is over to where they sit down and talk about things. Um, and, and to that end, the world really needs to seek justice uh, for, uh, uh, for, Ukraine, uh, for the Ukrainians. And um, uh, look, we did this after World War II. We need to do this now. Uh, Putin is, is, has gained uh, the same notoriety and, as far as I'm concerned, the same status on the planet as Adolf Hitler had. And I'm convinced they're going to be playing checkers together uh, pretty soon. Uh, but um, look, the, the, the world and the United States and the world really needs to hold the Russians accountable for this. We've all seen what they've done to the Ukrainian country. We've got $300 billion in assets frozen. I'm trying to get that unfrozen to where we can give it to the Ukrainians to start rebuilding. Uh, that really needs to be done. But uh, look, <clears throat> the Ukrainians are doing what Americans did in 1776. They are fighting for their, uh, for, for their freedom, for their independence. <clears throat> when you talk to them, they say they will die before they will go back and be serfs of, again uh, of, the Soviet, of the Russians. And, and I believe them. And this is going to take generations to, uh, uh, for, for any healing to take place. That's with the Ukrainians. As far as the European continent is concerned, I think the Russians may think that when it's over, everybody can say, well, it's over, we'll go back to buying gas and oil again for the Russians. That is not going to happen. The, the Europeans are fully cognizant that they made a real mistake uh, getting as embedded with the Russians as they have. They're not going to let that happen again. It's going to be generations before you see these, these things healing. So with that, Roger, you're out. <coughs> Well, Jim, I agree with everything you said, and uh, and you said it well. Yeah. Um, look, I'm, I've I've worn this flag every day that I've worn a lapel since February 24th of 2022. Uh, I, I noticed a lot of uh, um, yellow and, and blue uh, colors around the Kennedy Center and whatever. And some of them have faded. I'm I'm going to keep this on. Uh, Till, uh, till we have uh, a, a Ukrainian victory, as far as I'm concerned. So that's, that's where I stand on this issue. I think Jim is right uh, on point. And uh, he get, you know, J Jim was worried about going on too long. He, he started to give one, he gave one reason, and it was a good reason. We gave a promise, and, and the, um, the world uh, watches whether the United States keeps a promise. We, we've made commitments in the past, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry to say we didn't always follow through on them. Um, uh, the world watches what we do. They watch what happened in Afghanistan, and I, I, I wish the Afghans had been a little more stalwart, but uh, honestly, uh, we didn't give them the backing that they needed, to, to be quite frank, and we sent every signal for years and years that well, the main thing we wanted to do was get out of there. So the world watches what we do. We did give our word. We did give our commitment. And uh, this is one that we ought to keep. If you give up your nuclear weapons, we will be there for you. They need us now, and we need to be there for them. Uh, I, I would also add, you know, there's, um, there, there's the matter that it is in our national interest as Americans for the Russians to lose, for the Russian uh, military to be weakened, and, uh, and for Ukraine to be strengthened. Um, people are watching, as I said. China watched um, what happened in Afghanistan. Russia watched what happened in Afghanistan. Uh, the world watched what happened in 2014 when we really didn't uh, come to the rescue uh, of our friend. 
and, um, and so it is in our interest that China see the United States stand firmly behind an ally and help them to be successful. Um, if Taiwan is attacked by China, um, I really don't think we have any choice but to step forward and, uh, and be an ally of theirs. Uh, you can look at what our friends in the Indo-Pacific are doing and see that they believe this is in their interest. Japan, the Philippines, Australia are beefing up uh, not only to, um, to take the part of Taiwan if that happens, but also to help Ukraine because they think it's in our interest. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, peop th there's a difference of opinion about whether we should talk about the rules-based <coughs> international order. Some people like that and some people don't. I don't think it's the, it's the number one reason. But let me tell you this. We have had a pretty peaceful 75 years because we established some rules and most people have been willing to follow that. And now here comes uh, Vladimir Putin uh, showing that he doesn't really believe in the rules with regard to uh, invading um, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Uh, he obviously has designs on Moldova. Um, he went in in 2014 again. Um, we prosper when the rules are abided by internationally. We have had a peaceful, and our children and uh, our, our, our fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers uh, have had a successful uh, run of it because we have followed the rules-based order. So uh, there, there are all kind of reasons why it's in our interest uh, for Ukraine to win this, and I think they can win this. And I, w I would submit to you three little tidbits of news. Um, I don't know uh, um, how, um, how much y'all rely on the Wall Street Journal, but it's the first thing I want to read in the morning. I, I I don't know if I could do without the Wall Street Journal. And, I, and did you read the article on the front page today of the Wall Street Journal? The Russian economy is faltering. Now, the first year of this, they were selling a lot of oil and they are making a lot of money. That's not the case anymore. And uh, young people are, are uh, fleeing the country, the ones that have the means to do that and realize how wrong this is and also what a suicide min uh, mission it is are leaving the country by the tens of thousands. And, um, and, and so the Wall Street Journal article today, read that if you haven't. Uh, also, I'm trying to get ground truth on this, but the information that I have is that the Wagner Group uh, is sending every signal that they were about to pivot back to Africa. So we'll see about that. But, but let me just say, the Wagner Group is down to... Uh, four figures in terms of, uh, of the number of troops they have. They have been bogged down in a, in a fight for Bakhmut and, um, and, and a, a really a fairly meaningless strategic piece of ground, but both sides are dug in there, and they've, they've lost uh, they've just they've, they've lost really most of their personnel there in this fight. Um, which, the, which the Ukrainians have decided to take a stand on just to show that they can do it, and I think they probably uh, were correct in doing that. But if the Wagner Group is about to pivot back to Africa, that is a real signal that, that uh, Putin and his troops are about to be in trouble there. And also the third thing I would mention to you is that, um, that President Putin has now changed the conscription rules within Russia. The, uh, the, the uh, conscription age has now been, been lifted entirely. So we're going to have 35 and 40-year-old guys uh, drafted um, that, that like to have uh, three or four shots of vodka at night and uh, are totally out of shape. Um, th this is not a, a, a recipe for success in Ukraine. and, um, and, and on the other hand, the Ukrainians have just been exemplary. And, uh, and yes, they're fighting for their own country, as our uh, patriots were back in, um, 
1775 through 1778. The only difference is uh, our, our uh, colonies were divided back then, Jim. Um, that, you know, a lot of folks uh, kind of still liked the king and wanted to go to Canada, and a lot of people just scraping for a living. Uh, There's only about a third trying to help back then, and, and yet they were, they were fighting for their soul and for their country, just as the Ukrainians are. And, um, and so I don't know what's going to happen, but my information is that they have, that our friends, the Ukrainians, really are about to have um, a, a great deal of weaponry that they have lacked so far. And, uh, and that's going to make a difference. Um, so we'll, we'll undoubtedly, it's no secret, it's not top secret or confidential law, there, there will be a spring offensive, whether it will begin tomorrow or, or four weeks from today, I don't know. But there will be a spring offensive, and there's every reason to believe, based on what I've just told you, these three little uh, incidents, uh, but also based on the, the fact that there's the weaponry and we've seen the determination of this country and their leadership, uh, there's every reason to believe that the Ukrainians can have great success this year. The Secretary of Defense testified yesterday before the Armed Services Committee that he believes the Ukrainians have the upper hand. Now, he, he tried to qualify it somewhat, and obviously predictions are only predictions, but uh, I feel good about it. Uh, one word about uh, defense in general. We have plussed up the president's defense budget considerably for the past two years. And if you think about it, uh, we've done it on a bipartisan basis. We, we went up $30 billion uh, in 22. The 23 omnibus bill that passed in December, we went up $45 billion. And that was done when the Democrats had control of both the House and the Senate. Now there is a, a Republican majority in the United States House, and we still have the, um, a very close majority, depending on who's well and who's uh, sick um, in, the, in the United States Senate. I, I think the chances are that, that we can plus up the president's inadequate budget, um, again, um, for fiscal year 2024. The budget the president submitted to us assumes we're going to have two point something inflation for the next fiscal year. Raise your hands if you think we're, we're going to have only two uh, point something percent inflation uh, for the next 12 months. Uh, it, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, it is a cut um, in terms of our capability. It is a real cut in, in, in real buying power. It um, it requires the it, it would require the retirement of an entire class of amphibious ships. Um, there is no stomach for doing that in the in the United States Senate Armed Services Committee. We'll see what can be done with a very very small Republican four vote majority in the House of Representatives. Um, but I do believe in terms of of where. The majority of Republicans are over there, and the majority of Democrats are over there. You're going to see the same kind of realism, and the Congress will uh, will step in, as we've done the last two fiscal years, and rescue the president from a very inadequate defense budget. So thank you very much. Glad to be here. Time to go. <laughs> Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, um, not only for those remarks, but for your consistent leadership on this issue. Um, and if I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to pair a couple of questions based on your remarks, and then you can take either one as you, as you want and as you want to comment on it. The first one is both of you mentioned um, the, the slowness of weaponry being provided to Ukraine, that you want to give them more. And, and I've noted that you've, you've both um, been in favor of attack uh, when the administration um, is, still, is still not um, willing to provide those. Senator, you mentioned F-16s. Uh, you're both in favor of HIMARS. Um, and, now, and now you've uh, supported publicly to pick to get them to Ukraine to be able to, 
to to fight back on the rush. So really, the the criticism from from your leadership role has not been that the United States does not have a stake in Ukraine, but that we need to help them win. So can you talk about that, about the administration's um, approach to this, uh, slow weapons, um, and, and do, you, do you sense that, that that is going to change, or, or how do we finally get to the end of this, of this conflict in, in helping Ukraine actually prevail over, over Russia? And then, um, and then my second one was, what kind of threat does Russia still pose to NATO? You hear some people say, listen, Russia can't even take on Ukraine. Do they still pose a threat to, to, to NATO? So um, either one of those questions, if you want to comment on it, um, Senator Rich. I'll well, I'll take, a, I'll take a, a run to begin with. Uh, first of all, I've been critical of the administration because they're not moving fast enough. The, the fact of the matter is they've done the right thing. The problem is how long it took them to get there. And, and in, uh, in defense of the administration, Every time I've sat down with them, and, and they do make themselves available to talk from time to time, um, they really haven't pushed back that hard. And they, uh, they're, they're, you're able to, to get them along to the point, but we shouldn't have to do that. You know, uh, uh, look, this thing needs to be over with. We need to give them everything that we can possibly give them now and, and let them uh, bring this thing to an end. That, that, that's the way this thing's got to go. Uh, again, I don't... I don't want to be overly critical of the administration because they do, they, they have done a lot of things when uh, uh, tanks and everything else, when we've pushed them, but it's, it's been a year, you know, and they, they should uh, have a lot more. The second question is more interesting, and that is what, uh, what, what position are the Russians in right now? And uh, do they, uh, uh, are, are they a threat to NATO? Uh, there's a joke going around in the capital that says right now the Estonian army could march on Moscow and they couldn't do much about it. Uh, I don't I think that's probably overstating the case. But look, they have proven themselves to be just absolutely incompetent on the battlefield. And uh, like I said, you wonder how high up that goes, where it goes through air power, whether it goes through nuclear power. They, they claim it's corruption that has done this. The money that they were supposed to be spending has gone to the oligarchs and what have you. Maybe that's gone up. We don't know. But um, uh, I, I think there's two things that, that, that Putin is smart enough not to do. Number one, I don't think he'll use a nuclear weapon. That's all radar, uh, saber rattling, I'm, I'm convinced of it. But number two, I think he'll go through great pains not to attack a NATO country. Because we have said from the beginning, Article 5 means exactly what it says, and we're not going to give up one square inch. The, the, the uh, Baltics came in to see me right after the thing started, and they were looked like deer in the headlights, you know, and he said, well, you know, we're right there on the front lines, 1.5 million, 1.5 million, 2.5 million, you know, if he wants us, you know. And we said, look, I don't care whether that square inch is on your border or whether it's in Los Angeles or London. Article 5 means exactly what it says, and, and I, think, I think Putin believes that. I really do. If we were fighting a war in Europe against Russia, which we are not having to do, thankfully, because the Ukrainians haven't asked us. They're willing to do all the fighting themselves. But if we were there, we would want the F-16s, wouldn't we? We would insist on that in the attack. Of, we would insist on everything possible to defeat the enemy. And that's what uh, Senator Risch and I and others have been urging on the administration, to give them the tools they have to win and win quickly. And yes, there has been um, a, a grudging um, delay, but yes, uh, uh, the, for example, the tanks um, that were announced maybe three weeks ago, we, uh, they, they will not be available for a spring or summer or even fall offensive. Uh, but they could have been had, uh, had the administration acted when they should. So. Um, Yes, I would. Uh, I would uh, do attack them. And, and uh, was it Millie yesterday, who basically said, um, "We are not giving F-16s because uh, what they really need is long-range fire." Well, fine. Let's let's give them attack them. So um, that that's the answer to that question. Now, with regard to NATO, um, here's the point we need to make: We are reserving some uh, funds and some capability for the traditional defense of NATO against Russia. My view is that, uh, that there's not a chance in the next 
few years that Russia would take any move against any NATO uh, country. They are uh, they're really tied up uh, with this ill-conceived uh, 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 venture in Ukraine. And so we should think of, um, of persuading our NATO friends to uh, work with us and move some of the capabilities, say, to defense, to defend Spain and France and, um, and all the other countries and uh, move that capability to where we really need it, and that is defeating Russia by these valiant uh, Ukrainian fighters. So, um, uh, and, and Jim is right, and I want to emphasize this. Article 5 is sacrosanct, and it, it would be an abomination if the, if the United States did not abide by that in our NATO commitment. And I think another point, just to, I think both of you, that was uh, uh, very compelling. And it's also kind of one of those things where, Senator, if, if because the United States has had this commitment to Article 5, that part of deterring Russia is that we, we would have troops there in the Baltic countries. We, we you know, I, I know I just got back from Lithuania and, you know, there. Well, then, you know, we do have troops there and we've actually bolstered the troops on the, uh, on, on the eastern flank. And like I said, I think that eastern flank is going to get... Uh, is going to get uh, beefed up uh, when when the uh, when the shooting's over with, and they, and of course you know I mean Putin would love love to have the Baltic countries. I mean it, they they actually divide Russia. They've got uh, he's got a piece of Russia that's uh, on the other side of the Baltic. Yes, yeah, Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. So it's kind of one of those questions where you know no you know we we think that Russia wouldn't dare to do it, but it's because the United States has this strong commitment, and that's demonstrated by troops there by support for. Our Baltic uh, friends. Well, that and the enthusiasm of the Europeans too. He he really thought the Europeans would be split on this. That they would, Europeans aren't. <laughs> I, I got to tell a, a story. You know, for years I've been doing this, and uh, the Europeans would come in and say, "You American cowboys, you know, slow down, take it easy." They're coming in now saying, "You Americans need to toughen up." These are the French talking to me. <laughs> okay, so you say, "Well, you know." Uh, but uh, they they have a they ha it's in their backyard and so they they have a they have a real commitment to this and uh, and and have been vocal about it. They're not split. Right. And then uh, Senator, some one of y'all, maybe both of y'all, brought up China. So I want to talk about a little bit about Xi coming in and and chatting with with Putin and talking about potential negotiating some kind of peace agreement. And there's been some accusations from some saying, look, that U.S. support for Ukraine has brought these two individuals together. Um, one, is that true? Um, and what do, you, what do you make of this growing um, alliance between these two countries? Well, to open with, that, that, that is not true. They were, they were fast friends during the Cold War. I mean, uh, you know, two uh, uh, autocracies that are authoritarian governments, uh, communist in nature, uh, they, were, they were friends then. They're not natural allies. They, you know, they don't really... Remember, before uh, Russia was a senior partner, China was the junior partner. That's reversed now. China's the senior partner, and 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 Russia's the junior partner. But the thing that I, I tell you, the thing that has surprised me to a uh, to a degree is that um, that the Chinese, when they first met with the Russians, remember they had this press conference and said, "Oh, they had this unlimited partnership." Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they're standing there holding hands, and uh, and they've held hands throughout. But what have they really done? They really have not done much. They, they bought gas and oil, no question about that. But as far as providing the Russians with either troops or, or uh, for real, honest-to-goodness weaponry, they, they just haven't done it. So they, they love to... Um, the, the next emperor of, uh, of China. Um, they can make a decision not to go forward with... Um, reuniting with Taiwan, um, and they can decide to be prosperous and uh, continue to provide jobs and economic uh, opportunity for their people who really are not doing particularly well right now. Um, and they, it, they will make that decision if we and Japan and the Philippines and our allies in the Indo-Pacific uh, send a show of strength that um, that they will not be uh, that will they will not be successful and so they won't try it peace through strength um, gave us peace during the Reagan years and um, and
and strength w is is the best antidote for, for what uh, Xi Jinping wants to do. Well, then on that point, sir, too, there, there's this argument out there that says, you know, because China is the bigger problem, and because some Europeans have stood up, and there's, we've got wealthy European nations, then why not just leave Europe to handle the Ukraine problem? Um, because we are depleting our own weapons, and we need to focus on China. You mentioned, Senator, the, the defense budget. We've got to increase the defense budget. Is that to make sure that we can deter both Russia and China and successfully prosecute a war in U.S. interests if deterrence fails? Or do we need to pick one theater over no, the other? Okay. No. We, you know, uh, back when I came to the Congress, uh, that was our, our position, that we, that we could win two major theater wars at the same time. We, we've gotten away from that because we didn't think there would be one. But um, if need be, uh, we, we would have to gear up in a very quick way, like we did in World War II, um, and, and make sure that, that Russia and China don't take over their spheres of influence. So um, I, I, I think it is a false argument to say, we don't need to help Ukraine defend against Putin because we need to be, um, we need to be more concerned about China. Spending $130 billion so far, and undoubtedly there will be more expenditure, is a bargain if we prevent the trillion dollars that the United States and the West and our um, allies would have to spend to, um, to contain China if they decide to take over Taiwan. Uh, and that's a great point, Senator. And, and the other thing that I kind of push back on folks, too, I say, you know, what if, if this war does expand? I mean, the EU is still the United States' greatest trading partner, and so just the economy and the well-being of the American people is directly tied to the security and the prosperity of Europe. And so there is a, a clear tie there, and if the United States is going to be moving some, some, um, some of our, our goods and supply chains from China, it's going to have to go to other friendly areas, which would be Europe. So you can see the two uh, connected there as well. Um, what about this question of, of, of weapons oversight and how the United States has, has done on that to, yeah. to be able to, to steward the American taxpayers' dollars well and to give them confidence that, that we're doing that, a good job? That, that's a really good question, and, and I get that all the time from taxpayers, and, and a, a legitimate question on their part. Um, look, we have 64 different... Uh, enterprises going on overseeing the expenditure of funds and the delivery of weapons uh, in Ukraine. This is not, uh, this is not Afghanistan that was, a, that was almost impossible to keep track of. We are able to keep track of this. We're doing a good job. They, they report to us regularly. There, there's been absolutely no uh, siphoning off of either weapons or cash be, beyond what it's supposed to go for. But more importantly, there is a more important uh, uh, thing in place uh, to see that, uh, that this doesn't happen. I sat down with Zelensky, and I, I had a frank conversation with him that that country had a real uh, reputation, well-deserved for corruption before this war started. He admitted that. The Ukrainians will admit that when you talk to them. Um, I, I explained to him in clear terms that there's no better way to stop the United States from assisting than finding stuff going in the wrong place. He understood that. The Ukrainians understand that. And I truly believe that, uh, that, this, that, that, that corruption was so endemic in, uh, in Ukraine. I, I didn't know how you could ever contain that. I think this is going to be a cleansing operation because now they view any theft or siphoning off as being very unpatriotic. When, they, when they're fighting an existential war for their existence, I, I think this is going to change Ukraine. I really do. And I, didn't, I don't think there was much out there that, that, that could turn that, that around. It's, it's a really interesting point. Uh, there's so, you know, so many people sort of haven't updated their facts and information from the course of the war, is that, yes, Ukraine had this problem of corruption, um, still, still not as bad as Russia. Russia is far, far more corrupt. But that because of this war, you're actually going to uh, get rid of a lot of corruption that has plagued that part of the world. Well, the the you know corruption. Most Americans don't understand how in, how ubiquitous corruption is around the world, and it's a mindset. 
uh, as much as anything else. If a, if, if, uh, a culture accepts uh, corruption, they accept corruption, and it, and, it, and it grows and it spreads. I think it's a mindset. I really do. And I, I think that, uh, that the mindset is changing here as far as how important uh, honesty is and, and correct uh, acting is uh, to the success of a country. Yeah. I'm glad Jim made that point. Uh, c corruption has been a problem in Ukraine, but it's all over Eastern Europe. Uh, and regrettably, um, among some of the uh, countries that were um, behind the Iron Curtain under the control of the USS are, uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to name countries, but just a whole lot of the Western Balkans of uh, Eastern Europe is just shot through with corruption, and um, it's something we need to work on. But right now, um, our top priority is making sure Putin uh, doesn't take over a sovereign nation that would uh, establish borders. And one thing on that, too, that the corruption exists to the extent that these countries are trying to get out from underneath the former Soviet influence and become part of the West. So one of the best things we can do to help, help some of that is, is do what we can to, to strengthen NATO and make sure that it's moving in the right direction. Um, and I want to talk about another, it made me think of it, Senator, when, you, when you, we talked about, it might be silver lining that we're going to, that the Ukrainians have kind of had this moment where they, they really, it's really against their interest to have any kind of sign that some of this stuff isn't going in the right place because the Americans and the whole world are really watching. Another silver lining, uh, Senator Wicker, you brought up that um, with the amount of money that has been sent uh, over, only about half of that might my facts are right here, has really gone to military, military, and the rest of it's some of economic aid, and maybe that's not quite right, but um, only a portion of it is, is weaponry, and in fact, the weapons that the United States are, are sending um, has actually had this, this sort of, you know, unintended effect of rebooting the American industrial capacity yeah. to get some of these things going for our own and it's been And it's been a wake-up call. Real wake-up call. Um, no question it about it. It really has. So if the if, if we're ever called on to fight, and uh, undoubtedly we will be at some point, um, it's inevitable, then, then uh, we are not, our, our industrial um, base is not ready to gear, uh, to gear up, as it was not ready in 1941. We had two back-to-back wake-up calls. One was COVID, when uh, people said, well, where are the masks? Where's the, where's all this stuff? Well, it's in China, you know, and people started examining the, uh, started examining our supply chain from top to bottom mm -hmm. and realized we had some real vulnerabilities. In my judgment, the number one vulnerability was microchips. Uh, you know, we invented that here in the United States, and, uh, and the, the, the industry uh, did what most industries would do, and that is they chased the siren of, uh, of lower costs, and that sent them overseas. Now, of course, we've passed the CHIPS Act, we're trying to bring uh, those back again. Microchips are, are so essential to everything. The, the Russians are actually, uh, uh, they've, they've been reportedly taking refrigerators and other things apart, taking the chips out of them so they can use them for some of their, uh, uh, some of the weapons uh, that they make that require uh, uh, chips. So um, th th that is important. Then, as Roger made reference to, and that is our industrial uh, complex, it, one of the, one of the, uh, shortcomings is our uh, our uh, manufacturers are really really good at what they do they gear up when they get a contract from the pentagon they make the kind of weapons they want they're the best in the world but they don't keep making them uh, they'll they'll shut down their production line if they don't have another contract roger can speak to this uh, better than i can because he deals with that uh, more regularly but the the uh, th there's got to be a way of of uh, of having a sustainable production line. The best example I can give you is the HIMARS. We went, you know, I, I, I was after the White House. Yeah, get the HIMARS up there. Well, you know, we've only got so many, you know, and we need them in case this happens or that happens. Well, come on, guys, you know, let's let's crank up the, well, they the, the timeline they gave me to crank up to, to make HIMARS again was staggering, you know. I mean, we made them, and then we shut everything down. Roger. The, the way to make weaponry and ammunition is for Congress to pass a bill to fund it and for the government to order the weaponry and, and the ammunition. 
but your question also gives me a chance in the in the time uh, remaining I, I do want to talk about burden sharing because you mentioned that that um, much of what we've sent has been humanitarian and that's true um, the fact is we've spent or prepared to spend now 130 billion dollars our European uh, allies and I think this is EU and NATO it's about 80 billion we certainly wish they were spending it at least as much as as we are um, and that should be our goal to to uh, um, exhort them uh, to help in their own neighborhood to the extent um, that, that we are helping up. But, but let's bear in mind th that they, they are, there, there's a hidden cost that isn't calculated in that. They're accepting the refugees, uh, not only from, uh, from Ukraine, but from other um, Eastern Euro European countries who've had, had to go somewhere else. And so Poland, for example, uh, all of the money that they have spent housing refugees and providing for them is not calculated in what we looked uh, at in the burden sharing. So really, it, when, when you look at what Europeans have done to house and feed and care for their neighbors, their contribution really in terms of dollars and cents is uh, probably more than ours. Yeah, and I want to underscore that because we, we do get a lot of pushback from taxpayers saying, well, the Europeans ought to be uh, uh, ought to be paying their fair share. Anecdotally, I can tell you, for years we've been after the Europeans to say, spend the the two percent on defense as you agreed to do or as required by NATO. And for years they said, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. We're going to get to it by 2030. Along comes Donald Trump. Now, whatever else you think about Donald Trump, he said, gee, do we really need NATO? And all of a sudden, the Europeans said, yeah, I think we do. And uh, and he said, well, then you ought to pay your fair share. And all of a sudden, they started writing checks. You've got and, to pay. Uh, and he got them. He got them paying. He really did. Now, of course, uh, with the with the Ukraine war, that's being looked at yeah, even more closely. And as Roger said, uh, there are a lot of expenditures that uh, that the Europeans are coughing up. Poland's a good example. When I went to Ukraine, I went through Poland, and I said, "Where are the refugees?" And they said, "Well, it's the only country I'd ever been to that had millions of refugees, but there was no refugee camp." And the reason was they'd taken them all into their home. They were living in their home. So. Um, look, they're, they're, if you're going to do an accounting, you need to do a legitimate accounting where all the costs uh, that, are, that are coughed up by the countries are considered, not just the, the military expenditures. I, great point, sir. I was just in, uh, when I was in Warsaw a few months ago, it was the same thing. I kind of walked out of the hotel and you see all these women and children walking around where well, they were Ukrainian. Yeah. All the women and children are in Poland, and many of them are. And, and as you pointed out, the Baltic nations, Poland, it's really been their whole society has taken on the, a lot of the burden of this and taken in um, refugees uh, just uh, out of it's the goodness true. of their hearts. So the Baltic states and Poland and the Czech Republic remember how it was right. not to be free. It's amazing. Yeah. And they don't ever want to go back. They, and they will not ever go back. And, 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 on that, and in the case of Lithuania, too, I know not only have they got the threat right and are clear eyes about that, but on the China threat, too. They've yeah. been really leading and trying to They were to on the front you. line on that, yeah. uh, more so than a lot of their European neighbors. I think we've got time for one question from the audience. Oh. Um, I'm so sorry about this. Sir, just state your name, please. And then a very brief one to the senators, please. Thank you very much. Alexander Kravitz from Insight. Uh, it's great to have such a clear-eyed and strong support for Ukraine. Thank you for that. To Senator Rich, you, you, you mentioned the dust-up with Turkey in terms of the expansion of, of, um, of NATO. M maybe you could share with us how you see what that might take. Yeah. And just a quick follow-up. How should the U.S. see countries, particularly in our hemisphere, like El Salvador, who are abstaining on the U.N. resolutions calling for Russia to leave Ukraine? Uh, let me, let me uh, separate that in two. By the way, the, uh, uh, the Turkish question is the next hour, OK? Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, I, you know, <laughs> I've met with Erdogan a number of times. And uh, he's a, he, he is a, a difficult uh, case, uh, to say the least. But look, he's an opportunist. He is using the, uh, this issue 
uh, to get some stuff that he wanted. I, myself and the other, uh, and there's four of us, obviously, that have to sign off every time on weapons sales. Myself and Menendez in the Senate and two our counterparts in the House. And we put a hold on the F-35s because they bought the uh, S-400s. And that, uh, Erdogan did not like that, still doesn't like that. Now we're fighting over the F-16s. But he's using this uh, as a um, uh, tool to get what he wants. And, I, and we've lectured him over and over again. You're using your participation and your membership in this organization to feather your own nest. That's not right. And, and they get it. Uh, and we're going to get there. But he has an election coming up on uh, May 14th. And it's going to be a difficult election for him. Uh, he led in uh, uh, the uh, uh, Finland, but he Finland. didn't. But but not Sweden. Hungary, I wouldn't worry too much about. They're going to do whatever whatever Turkey does. They can't sustain if if uh, uh, if Turkey acts. Turkey's led in uh, Finland. I'm convinced they will let in Sweden. After the conversations I've had, I'm convinced they will let in Sweden eventually. I don't like the way it went down, but eh, you know, you do what you got to do to get from point A to point B. So. I'm, I'm going to let that other question go because I think we're out of time. But getting votes in the UN is always a problem. Uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield, who's our uh, our ambassador there, I think does a really good job of trying to round up votes. But look, y you know, we we've never been the fair-haired child of the other members of the United Nations. I fight all the time with the with the with he comes in and tells me what a great job the UN's doing, and I says, look, you got a war going on. There's 200 countries in the world, all but about six of them say this is a really, really bad deal. You can't stop it. Not only can't stop it, you can't even ratchet it back. You can't even pass a resolution to condemn it. And we're sending billions of dollars to the UN? Come on, you know what? Where are we? Well, then you get votes and, and China goes out and does their thing with money. So. Jim, Jim said Turkey's the next hour. Uh, South and Central America are then the, the, hour the second hour. That, yeah. um, when it comes to intelligence sharing and military to military, the the Turks are friends of Uncle Sam. They are, and we just uh, you know we, we don't like everything they do, and there is an election coming up. We don't know what will happen, um, but um, they're a valuable friend to us. They are. I worry about South and Central America. And you you mentioned one example, but. Uh, we, we've just got problems, and, and uh, we, while we're working on our, all of our problems that we've talked about, w we need to pay attention to um, the, the South America and Central America, where a lot of countries are going um, the wrong direction. Senators, thank you so much um, for coming here today and for being uh, great and strong clear voices for U.S. leadership in the world, engagement, um, and for making the case that the security and the freedom and prosperity of Europe is directly tied to America's. So thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Thank you all for joining us here at Hudson. Thanks for being here. Thank you.